Now let's discuss section four. In this one, we're going to discuss the Egyptian writing system, examine the temples, tombs, and art, and discuss King Tut and King Akhenaten to the other pharaohs. So, um, hieroglyphics are the Egyptian religious writing system. People typically think of hieroglyphics as being the main system of writing in Egypt. It wasn't. Um, hieroglyphics was more of the religious side. And now we're going to talk just briefly about papyrus. And I've got this that uh, I got to show to my students. I was going to show it to you over the video. This is what's known as papyrus paper. Now, if you look, you can see that it looks like it's kind of weaved together. This is a type of uh, durable paper. See, I'm pulling on. I'm not going to tear it because it does tear. But... It's pretty durable. Uh, it's a long-lasting paper lot material made from reeds. Basically what they would do, and I believe there's a video in the classroom for this as well, is that they would weave these reeds together to make a paper top material. Now this isn't as good a quality, probably because I paid like $4 for a pack of it, um, but it's not as good a quality, but that did come from Egypt. Uh, but papyrus paper is very long-lasting. And there are still documents that have been found that was written on papyrus paper. Uh, and so, and then this is just something else I'm going to show. This came with the papyrus paper I bought. It kind of shows you, uh, you know, some of the images, the, the alphabet, how things were written in Egypt, both with numbers and letters. And so, uh, but that's just a little bit about papyrus paper. Um, hieroglyph hieroglyphics could be written either vertically or horizontally. didn't really matter. And this shows you uh, a piece of papyrus paper, ancient papyrus paper, that has uh, writing on it. Now, the next thing I'll talk about, I've actually got a replica of this too, the Rosetta Stone. This is a replica of the Rosetta Stone. And of course, this is a lot smaller than the actual Rosetta Stone. But it is a stone slab inscribed with hieroglyphics. Historians and archaeologists knew about hieroglyphics for centuries. They had no clue how to read them until in 1799 when the French gave historians a lucky discovery. It was in hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek, the Greek making it capable to be interpreted. And so you see here on this picture, and I'll kind of show you this, the top section here is in uh, hieroglyphic, and so... That's it. But it's a hieroglyphic, demonic in Greece or Greek. And because of that, uh, the Greek is actually able to be read. And that's going to allow the people to interpret what the hieroglyphics part of it says. And that's why the Rosetta Stone is known as being a way to interpret languages. We understand to read how hieroglyphics now because of that. So that's the Rosetta Stone. Papyrus didn't decay in Egypt's dry climate, so we have many records of Egyptian writings. It's very good made. It's made out of reeds, so it's very durable. The Book of the Dead, which also there's a video on Google Classroom that you need to watch for that, is a text about the afterlife. It's, uh, uh, there's stories, poems, mythological tales, and government records that all survive as part of Egyptian text. And I'm getting tongue-tied today. The Book of the Dead tells about someone's journey into the afterlife and tells what you have to do. Like at one point, you have to weigh your heart against a feather to see if they weigh the same or if your heart is heavier than that feather. And that's the idea because um, the idea, even though a feather, of course, will weigh a lot less than a heart, the idea is you have to have a pure heart which should be lighter than a feather. The Egyptians are known for their architecture and art. Massive temples were built as places of worship, places to offer sacrifices, and they asked to God for favors. Uh, one thing that was created were the sphinxes. These are imaginary creatures with the bodies of lions and the heads of other animals or humans. And of course, the great sphinx, which is seen here, is one of the most well-known of Egyptian architecture, or, you know, Egyptian architecture of uh, the Great Sphinx that has the head of a person and the body of a lion. An obelisk is a tall four-sided pillar 
that's pointed on top. The Temple of Karnak is the only one of Egypt's great it is only one of Egypt's great temples. Uh, an obelisk, before I move off of that, that's what the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. is, is an obelisk. There's also a lot of them in Egypt. They're tall, four-sided pillars that has a point on top, kind of like a little pyramid on top. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of some of this stuff. Uh, and then the Temple of Abu Simbel has a 66-foot-tall statue that shows Ramses and Pharaoh. This is an obelisk. And, of course, the Washington Monument is an obelisk as well. Here's the Temple of Karnak. And here's the Temple of Abu Simbel. And so you see here, and you see where this broken one is fell and landed right here. But look how tall the people are compared to this. This is carved out of a rock face. This is carved into a mountain by ancient people. That's insane that they were able to do this. And we see this, you know, we saw it in China where these Buddhist temples were carved into the sides of mountains. In Egyptian art, people are seen from the side like this. The Egyptians were skilled stone workers, so many of the tombs had large statues and detailed carvings. The Egyptians also made things out of gold and precious jewels. So now let's get into a couple of these pharaohs briefly. Akhenaten is one of the most interesting Egyptian pharaohs because he's a pharaoh that brought monotheism to Egypt. Uh, he's believed to be the father of King Tut, and he worshipped the god Aten, which his name is Akhenaten. Um, he brought monotheism. So he brought the worship of one God, Aten. And people are going to not like this. After he dies, they quickly bring back the polytheistic belief system. Uh, but Akhenaten, there's a lot of, I, I find it interesting because there's a lot of strange things that are associated with Like, for example, they don't know where he's buried. They don't know where his tomb is. Some people believe that uh, because he was a disgrace, because of having monotheism in Egypt, that he was erased from history. Um, you know, there's some some crazy theories like that he's an alien, uh, and that he's you know that that's why some some theories believe that he may be the the biblical Moses, and that that when because Akhenaten just disappears like. There's no record of him. Uh, like something happened to him. You know, so that's why that, the ancient alien people believe that he went to space. Uh, the people believe that he was actually Moses believes that he was when Moses fled in the Exodus and that that was him. So there's a lot of crazy things out there. Historically, we believe that he's the father of King Tut and he did bring monotheism to Egypt. But there's a lot of crazy things under about Akhenaten. And you see this is Akhenaten and this is, you know, he looks different to most pharaohs. He's very skinny, long, slender face, almond-shaped eyes. Um, he looks a little bit not as healthy as some of the rest of the pharaohs. And so a lot of people have some suspicious about who he really is. King Tutankhamun is King Tut. Uh, his tomb wasn't disturbed until 1922 when an archaeologist discovered it. When it was open, it was filled with jewelry, robes, a burial mask, ivory statues, and it showed us even more by the way that their ancient customs were because it was an it was an undisturbed tomb that was found. And if you have a copy of our textbook at home, there is a picture of King Tut's burial mask on the front of that. And here's a picture of it. So that brings us to the end of this section. Uh, again, comparing Akhenaten and King Tut, uh, King King Tut was really only, only famous because of his two men found. He really didn't do a whole lot. Uh, he, he did lead people into battle, and he, they believed he was a military leader. But he was very young when he died. Akhenaten, uh, they said that they tried to erase him from history. Uh, he was a disgrace and things like that. So it's a very interesting concept between these two different pharaohs. So that brings us to the end of Section 4.